everyone. This is Dave Debo with another episode of the Property Profits Real Estate Podcast. Today, zooming in all the way from beautiful Georgia, we've got Atticus LeBlanc. Welcome, Atticus. And, and Atticus is doing something very, very cool with his company called Pad Split. So first of all, welcome to the show. Great to have you with us. Thank you very much, Dave. Really appreciate the opportunity and it's a pleasure to be here. All right. So Atticus, let's get right into the, the guts of the matter. What the heck is pad split? What is, yeah. what is this whole concept? I understand what a pad is. I understand what a split is. What is pad I mean, split? You, you got it right there, Dave. Yeah, it's a uh, you know, pad is a house and you split it up. It's um, so it's a, it's a shared housing concept that I had discovered in the early years of my real estate investing career when I started buying houses 13 years ago and kind of had some uh, two real takeaways when I was you know, in markets trying to buy homes. And uh, one was just, I was shocked at the number of people that were working full time that could not afford any traditional housing options uh, and were ultimately sharing, sharing homes. Uh, and then two was uh, that in a shared setting, when I had two guys that were renting rooms in a, in a rundown shack next to a house that I owned, uh, they came to me and wanted to come rent rooms. And I realized, wait a second, if you're going to pay me on a weekly basis, uh, I would actually earn more through this model uh, than I would renting the whole house traditionally. And so that was that was the beginning of the concept. Uh -huh. uh, and it's evolved pretty considerably since then uh, and now exists as a technology company so that uh, any similar property investor or owner in the same position that I was in in 2008 and nine uh, has the ability to use our services uh, to ultimately scale this business model in the markets that they're in. All right. So basically, the idea is instead of renting out your single family home as a complete unit to one family, you break it out into individual rooms, rent out furnished rooms to individuals. And the, you know, by chunking it down like that and, and providing it as, as a furnished rental, you're able to A, provide affordable housing for people that couldn't really get into something decent otherwise. And B, actually increase your 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 revenues and your profits because you're doing it this way. Is, is that the gist of it? Exactly right. Yeah, we, we talk about uh, making affordable housing possible by also making it profitable. I uh, like that. I like that. And, so yeah. what's the biggest difference between, because it sounds kind of like Airbnb in a, in a way, but different. So how would you compare this to the concept that everybody can get their head around, which is Airbnb, how does this? Yeah, well, the, the the similarity is that we we exist as a technology marketplace, very similar to the way that Airbnb exists. Uh, and so you have uh, a guest who is staying at the property, or in our case, is a, a member. There is a host who's usually the property owner, and then there is Airbnb, right? And that's the same that's the same kind of setup for us. So. Uh, the, the major differences are this is primarily geared towards uh, the workforce in your community. So it's the people who are uh, manning the cash register at your local grocery store or delivering your Amazon packages uh, or the, the waitress at your, at your local diner. Um, and it's for longer term. So the average tenure right now for us is 10 and a half months. Uh, and then, of course, the other major difference is you have lots of people who are sharing the home together. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you have to, to build the technology to assume that you're and accommodate those longer term agreements. And we're usually billing weekly as well. And so uh, the way that we're set up is much different from Airbnb to accommodate uh, all of uh, an all inclusive payment that is that is usually billed on a weekly cycle uh, with each one of those individuals sharing that home billed separately and independently. All right. Very cool. So just off the top of my head, it kind of sounds a little bit like a recipe for disaster. Yeah. Having a bunch of strangers sharing a house sure. together, you know, especially you got four or five rooms in a house or six rooms in a house uh, without having, you know, the owner living in the house himself or herself. It, it sounds like a lot to kind of juggle. So how are you guys able to help the, the homeowner out with the, the it, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a common misconception, Dave. Uh, I mean, the, uh, the, the, one of the analogies I would I would compare is first and foremost, how long have have people been living together and sharing housing? Ultimately, it's been since the time we were living in caves. And 
how many times have you seen fights break out in the middle of an airplane, despite the fact that you're packed in there like sardines? <laughs> and it doesn't matter well, how you, long. On YouTube like, on a fairly regular basis, but yeah. yeah. I, it just, I mean, listen, we, we are programmed as a species to, to get along together and live socially. Uh, and shocker, we, we usually do most of the time. Uh, and just like when you're, when you're sitting crammed in that airplane uh, next to someone that you may not particularly like, uh, you just, you, you keep to yourself a little bit more and uh, it's not like the, the fights just break out left and right. And, and that's largely true for, um, uh, for our model as well. But, uh, but yeah, I think the, the key thing to point out is it, the, the idea of sharing is, is not new. Yeah. Uh, and in many aspects, what's, what's really interesting and, and misunderstood is uh, the households generally perform much better from a maintenance and just uh, behavior standpoint than they would if you had, so I, I had an older brother uh, and like we got in fights all the time, right? And as a landlord, uh, I would have no idea if two brothers were fighting in the house. Right. Whereas now, uh, as a technology platform, I know if someone leaves their dirty dishes in the sink. Uh, I know if they steals my cheese out of the refrigerator. I know if someone's playing their music too loud. I know everything. And so from our standpoint as a technology platform, we have insight into the day-to-day -day, uh, much more readily than we would under a traditional setting. Uh, and in that way, you know, you can certainly handle escalations as necessary. But by and large, we're, we're programmed as social creatures and uh, we, we get along uh, as, as humans uh, more often than not. Well, it sounds like your technology helps move that along a lot smoother as well. So yeah. Atticus, before we jumped on live, you kind of gave me the, the three big point overview of uh, pad split. So if you don't mind repeating yourself, could you give it for our, our viewers as well? Yeah, so uh, so three main things that uh, existing housing providers and landlords either cannot do or don't want to do. Uh, the first is lead generation and screening. So uh, our average tenant earns about $22,000 a year uh, and doesn't qualify for any traditional housing alternatives. Uh, and there's no single source of lead generation that markets to those individuals mm -hmm. uh, to, for this type of housing. So, so that is something that we do, and we are absolutely world-class at filling rooms super quickly. In Atlanta right now, we are booking rooms within hours and filling houses within eight to nine days on average. Wow. Um, the, uh, and then, of course, there's, there's no typical way to screen that individual as well. And so we have to and have had to iterate on ways to do that. The second thing is when we have caught six people sharing a house and we're billing all inclusive weekly, uh, that means that we're collecting 26 payments per month and very few landlords want to collect any more than one payment per month and they just want to forget about it. Uh, and so we step in for that yeah, aspect. They, they don't even like the idea of collecting six payments a month from one house. So yeah, like yeah, bingo. And, and then the third thing is just the accountability piece where uh, you create incentive structures uh, where members inside the home that are living there uh, are uh, motivated to to maintain good behavior. So they can give call outs and shout outs and resident ratings to each other that ultimately results in reputation scores. Uh, landlords, uh, we are reporting and, and recording how long it takes them to respond to certain maintenance tickets. So we know who our best performers are in that category. And uh, I can so make sure. It's kind of a little bit like uh, um, Airbnb in that sense that there's yeah. a rating for your, the tenant, there's a rating for the landlord, so they can kind of within the platform Definitely. check each other out ahead of time. Definitely. Very cool. All right. So let's pretend. I'm a frustrated landlord. I've got a single family home that's barely scraping by cash flow wise. Uh, I hear this idea of, of pad split. What are you looking for in a potential landlord who's interested in coming on board? What, what are kind of the minimum criteria? Sure. I'd say there are, there, there are two things. One, uh, we want to make sure that uh, the landlord is bought in. Uh, and so our, our guiding principles for all of our stakeholders and ourselves is to, to care, show it, and prove it. So you, you have to care about the housing situation that you're providing. Uh, we're not looking for slumlords. We want people who uh, care about the community that they're serving and are willing to make the investments and, and uh, draw that correlation between providing a quality product and getting a quality tenant. Uh, so that's, that's the first thing. The second thing is 
I think it goes without saying that any property investor is going to be motivated by the bottom line. So that's not necessarily something that we have to have to screen for. But assuming that they are, they have to have the capacity and the financial wherewithal to make the improvements to their property that uh, that would fit the model. So, uh, and so or what, what would be an example of that? What kind of what needs so, to happen? In this so, so the homes are fully furnished. Uh, so we, we do require that that the rooms are fully furnished. Uh, and with uh, the advent of Amazon and, and uh, the number of choices you have there, you can furnish a room for about six hundred to eight hundred dollars per per room. So it's not a huge cost, but it is cost. Uh, and then just the willingness to uh, to do something a little bit different, to think outside the box. Uh, but we also require, um, and I think it's it's in the landlord's best interest to make energy efficiency improvements uh, because they're ultimately footing the bill for the utilities, and so that increases their bottom line. Um, we require certain fire safety measures as well uh, that uh, that are that are laid out in the online uh, platform as people uh, go through that process. But uh, but yeah, there there are a couple of things where it's just optimizing the property is in their best interest, and and more often than not, because it's in their best interest, they'll go ahead and pursue most of those uh, most of those modifications. And what have you found as being like the ideal size of a property from a landlord lord's point of view where this actually makes sense to to rent out by the room versus the entire house yeah so uh, ideal i would say is somewhere between five and eight bedrooms uh where it's almost you, kind of like a student rental scenario similar, similar. yeah and, and, and you're converting rooms too generally because like in in most houses you've got a formal dining room well whoever got paid additional rent for their formal dining room no one ever yeah. And we're in a housing crisis where we're short seven and a half million homes and we have all these formal dining rooms and empty bedrooms that are out there sitting. And so why not use those to, to create new affordable stock? Uh, and what this allows you to do is, is to convert some of those rooms. So that's a uh, that's a huge part of it as well. That's a fascinating idea. Hold that thought for a second. Hi there. This is Dave Debo, and real estate investors hire me to raise capital the right way. Why? Because most of them are stuck with too small of a portfolio and they don't know how to attract investors and raise money for their deals. So I help them to connect, capture, and close their ideal money partners. Bottom line, when you've got a deal, you're going to have the capital to do it. So go ahead and book a no cost capital clarity session with me at bookachatwithdave.com. Again, that's book at chatwithdave.com. Sounds very, very cool. So that I, I see the attraction from the, the landlord side of things. I mean, this is a way to potentially generate more revenue from your single family home by renting it out by the room and furnished uh, furnish rental and, and outsource almost everything to you guys. <laughs> I mean, filling the place, collecting the rent, all that kind of good stuff. So I understand that. What's the big benefit from the tenant's point of view for being part of, of this versus everything and anything else they could do. Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, the reality is uh, the, the average rent right now in Atlanta is 1500 bucks. Okay. So if, if you run standard underwriting uh, at three times a monthly rent, that means you need to earn $55,000 a year to qualify for that unit. Well, how many people are in less than $55,000 a year? And you can run the math in whatever local jurisdiction you happen to be in. And the answer is it's a ton of people. Uh -huh. uh, and, and so the reality is the, the, the members that we're serving just don't have any good options. And more often than not, they're looking at extended stay motels as, as what they can access because they don't have income. Uh -huh. Not that those extended stay motels are cheap. They're absolutely not. And, and people can't afford them, but they can get in because they don't have a first month's, first, first month's rent deposit or a minimum credit score or things like that. And so the two things that, that we really offer for our residents is one, just accessibility. Uh, if, you know, to access our properties, there's a $29 application fee that, that we bill. Uh, and then usually the move-in fee covers the cost of cleaning a room. So it's about a hundred bucks. Uh, so it's really very little. There's no upfront deposit or admin fee or anything like that. And it's, uh, and it's, and it's relatively easy to get in. Uh, and then also the savings that they're seeing in real time, we're priced at 42 to 67 percent usually of a of a comparable studio or one bedroom apartment so it's just a lot cheaper and they're saving on the order of 500 bucks a month wow uh, that's huge for people in that income zone so let me ask you this atticus um you talk about atlanta are you guys all over the place yet or are you very focused sure. 
and elaborate. We uh, so so we we're active. Uh, we have active units today in five markets. We have another three markets that have units that are owned and under development by various landlords, and we're actively expanding into new markets today. So, uh, if if any of your viewers or listeners have uh, have municipalities or jurisdictions that they're that they're interested in looking at, uh, we'd be happy to talk to them. And we're trying to uh, trying to spread nationally and internationally. Yeah, so this is, yeah, this is pretty. It, it's kind of a startup kind of a situation right now. You're looking to kick it up to the next level. We got a lot of. Uh, a lot of folks in Canada uh, who are investors. Is there any thoughts of getting into the Canadian market as well? There is, yeah. We uh, we actually have some uh, some Canadian venture capitalists that are funding the company, and, and uh, they're tied into the what's called the prop tech space, real estate investing, and uh, we would absolutely look at Canada as well. Oh, well, that's wonderful. Now, one of the things that kind of caught my attention was you're typically billing. Two things caught my attention. First of all, you call your tenants members. Why do you call them members instead of tenants? Yeah, so the biggest thing is um, for, for them, it's more than a room. So we include all utilities, Wi-Fi, laundry. Uh, we also include credit reporting uh, and we include access to telemedicine. And that's what we that's where we stop today, but we may eventually include uh, more services as well. But we know that through our credit reporting, every payment we, we process gets reported to the, the agencies. And so 85% of our members will see an increase in credit scores while they're, while they're with us. Uh, the average increase is around 40 points. Uh, and then we know a lot of folks don't have access to, uh, I guess it's not the same in Canada, but a lot of, a lot of folks here don't have access to, uh, to health insurance. And so being able to, uh, to access for free a, a doctor on call 24 seven uh, can be a huge benefit as well. And, and so that's one of the main reasons as we think about uh, there being members of of a club or an organization uh, and and not just paying a rent somewhere. And I would imagine that you also have the opportunity where you've got you've got a somewhat transient uh, group as well. so they might be moving from one location to another, one city to another. and you can if they're if they're good members, they can plug right in if you have yeah. it up and running in a different city as well. Yeah, I think that's I think that's fair. Although a lot of uh, a lot of moves happen within a given city, and just happens uh, to coincide with what that average job tenure happens to be. Right. And if we know that people are changing jobs every six months, and oh by the way, they don't really have the ability to afford their own vehicle, right. it makes a lot more sense that they can transfer where they live uh, to move closer to that new job uh, right. than it does to uh, just have to have to figure out a way to commute. Now, is the is the weekly uh, charge set up for the convenience of your the tenants, the members, or is that also a way that uh, that you're able to evict somebody quickly and efficiently? Should there be a challenge because it's not a month to month rental; it's now a week to week type rental. What? How, how does that work? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the landlord tenant laws really just depend on whatever the local jurisdiction is. And in most cases, any stay beyond 30 days is going to require a, a standard eviction uh, and would fall under typical landlord tenant laws. Okay. Uh, the, the real reason for us is I'll ask you a question. Uh, what day of the week is August 1st? No, nobody no. knows. <laughs> no, nobody knows. I, I could ask that question to a room full of a thousand people and nobody would know. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so don't don't feel bad, but uh, the reality is nobody knows, nobody keeps track. But yeah. the entire real estate industry assumes that you have a tenant who you know is struggling financially, uh, and you say, okay, well, rent is always due on the first of the month. It has absolutely no correlation with when they're getting paid. And oh, by the way, then you're going to have an electricity bill that's due on the tenth, uh, or a, a Wi-Fi bill that's due on the seventeenth, and even though we all know you don't have $400 to your name to scrape together for emergencies, we're going to bank on you budgeting accordingly to guess which one to pay first and how much to pay where. Mm. The reality, like it just doesn't happen. Right. And if I say, okay, I'm going to include everything in one weekly bill. Today is Thursday. Tomorrow is Friday. And your bill is always due on Friday. It's a lot easier to remember. And then you allow customized billing cycles so that if your job happens to pay you every second Tuesday, fine, we can bill every second Tuesday. So as soon as that income comes in, you can get your bill straight. And that's a huge part of what the technology does. Yeah, that is that is huge. I can see that being a major, major benefit. Um, 
yeah, fascinating stuff at it because I can just, I can only imagine how much has gone into setting this whole thing up. I mean, it's, it's wow. smart. <laughs> this is very, so I had tip my fictitious hat to you there because uh, I can, I can imagine how much work has gone into this. So congratulations for that. And I think it's a brilliant model because unfortunately, uh, there's going to be nothing but huge demand for this now and forever. I mean, I, I can't see that that ever changing. One one other kind of thing just popped into my mind. Is this only for single people or what happens if you got like a couple or what happens if you got a single mom with a kid or or something like that? Or is there any accommodation for those kind of situations? Does that? Yeah, I mean. That's a lot of historically, fun. yeah, historically, we we have had uh, situations where couples have applied and we've had a very small handful where we've got we've had single parents with single children. Um, the limit has has been two people per household that got a little uh, a little iffy with covid. Uh, and and we said, OK, we're, we're just going to admit one person only during covid. Um and, and the other thing is really just sharing bathrooms. If you're sharing bathrooms in a home, we try to limit the number of people that are actually sharing a bathroom to no more than four in any given situation. Right. Um, and today, because most of the, the housing accommodations we have are uh, divided single family homes or divided apartments, uh, it's it's really a tough situation for a family. And, and even from an economic standpoint, not necessarily the best alternative. If we move into more accessory dwelling units, for instance, or uh, in-law suites, uh, then we will absolutely be able to accommodate larger household sizes uh, and still do the all-inclusive weekly billing and all the other things that we do. Um, but we just don't have a lot of those situations today. And yeah. we envision that over time we will, but but yeah, just it doesn't happen a lot. Now, another thing that just came to my mind, sorry, I'm throwing these all these random questions at you, but it, it just it's fascinating. So with the the weekly all inclusive billing, I, I imagine not everybody that you're working with has a checking account per se or a credit card or what. How, how are you getting paid? Like how, yes, how you... so, uh, most of them. Are, so almost everyone's paying electronically. Uh, we have we have a couple partnerships with local nonprofit organizations or agencies, but uh, but overwhelmingly people are using prepaid debit cards. Uh, and so even if they don't have bank accounts per se, they almost always have access to prepaid debit cards. And that's how we're getting those those payments. And I mean, the, the interesting thing and the reason why I'm, I'm just such a strong believer in the uh, in the per payday or weekly billing model, you take this this group of, of folks that would usually be considered a subprime credit group. I mean, our credit scores on the way in is around 461 income is around 22 grand. Well, our collections rates effectively are 95%. Mm -hmm. uh, and that shocks a lot of people. And, and I attribute most of that to, one, we're verifying income on the way in. So we know that this person has a job. Uh, and two, uh, just the fact that, that it's that all-inclusive weekly bill. And it's easy to yeah. remember. And yeah. most people want to pay their bills. Uh, and, and it's as simple as that. No, and they need a place to live. And it's, no, it's, uh, that's very, very smart. Atticus, we could chat all day about this, but uh, it's it's fascinating. If people want to find out more about you and about uh, about PadSplit, what should they do? Uh, just go to www.padsplit.com. Uh, there is an entire section on four hosts uh, that has a, a calculator there that they can plug in whatever they want to plug in for their particular property and and get a result and see uh, see if it can be beneficial for them. Awesome, very good. Well, thank you very much. This has uh, been a lot of fun. Great. Thank you, Dave. All right, everybody. Take care. See you on the next episode. Bye-bye. Well, hey there. Thanks for tuning into the Property Profits Podcast. If you like this episode, that's great. Please go ahead and subscribe on iTunes. Give us a good review. That'd be awesome. I appreciate that. And if you're looking to attract investors and raise capital for your deals, then I'm going to invite you to get a complimentary copy of my newest book, right back there. There it is. The Money Partner Formula. You can get a PDF version at InvestorAttractionBook.com. Again, InvestorAttractionBook.com. Take care.